program for you tonight. Uh, uh, we have uh, Marissa Kern, um, who's a MD and Associate Program Director of the Family Medicine Residency of Western Montana. Um, and uh, that's a three-year training program for physicians who have completed medical school and are doing their specialty training in family medicine. Um, this uh, family medicine program of Western Montana, which did its first year, uh, has a particular focus on training physicians to work in rural and underserved areas of Montana. Um, <clears throat> tonight, this is accompanied by Dr. Harshida Chauhardi, Dr. Megan Zweck, and Dr. Sarah Zuga, who are all part of this inaugural class and are nearing the end of their first year of training in Missoula. They're going to talk to us today about how international experiences has had an impact on their interest in medicine and the fact that they're here in this residency program. But is this, does this work? No. Okay. We're just going to have to project. And this is really meant to be very informal and interactive. And so I would encourage those of you who are sitting in the back, the Karshida in particular, is, fairly soft-spoken, so um, I'd encourage you to move down if you want just to be able to hear a little better. And, um, we're certainly open to any questions that people might have, and um, what we thought we would do is just start out by taking a few minutes, each of us, to introduce ourselves and our background and um, how we ended up going to medical school and into family medicine in particular. And then um, I've got a few questions which um, will open up to the panel, but we really do welcome questions for all of you as well. And just out of curiosity, so how many people in the room are undergrads? Okay, awesome. So by far the majority. Any graduate students at all? Okay. And other, uh, any other health professionals? <laughs> All right, I see that row right there. <laughs> Good, we will be um, calling on you guys as well. Uh, so just as a way of introduction, and I think um, uh, my dad, which he think, <laughs> failed to mention, but this is my father, um, uh, said... I mentioned that last week, that my daughter was in Oh, okay, all right, Good. so they were prepared. <laughs> um, so family medicine, a family medicine residency is actually a, a specialty training that occurs after four years of medical school. So after graduating from uh, college, um, everybody has done four years of medical school, and then you choose a specialty to go into, and depending on what specialty you go into, it's varying length of training. And just, you know, for those of you who may not know, up until uh, this year's class started here in Missoula, there was only one residency training program in the entire state of Montana, and that was in Billings, um, which means that Montana was ranked 50th last in the nation for graduate medical education. And one of the things that we know is that where people train and do their residency training is a huge predictor as to where they end up practicing after, after they finish. Um, usually on average about 70% of residents will stay in the same general region where they've done their residency training. And so the fact that Montana really had only had one program five hours away up until this point has meant that it's been a very difficult place to attract and retain physicians to live and work, and particularly in rural underserved areas. Um, so 11 out of the counties, in there are 56 counties in the state of Montana, 11 of them have no 
physicians whatsoever <coughs> practicing in them, and 54 out of 56 counties are officially designated as a health professional shortage area. HIPSA is what we call it for short. And so there is a huge need in this state. Um, and so we're very hopeful by having new young doctors training and getting practical experience here that we will be able to start meeting some of that need within our state. And um, as my dad mentioned, uh, the, one of the focuses for this program is really on <coughs> training physicians to be prepared to work in rural and underserved parts of Montana. And so um, each of them will spend a month in their second year and a month in their third year doing rural rotations. There are about eight different sites and development throughout western Montana that we're partnering with for the residents to be able to go out and do practical <coughs> experiences. Um, four of the ten that we matched for this year actually chose to use some of their elective time to do rural experiences in this first year. And Sarah is one of them who, um, who spent some time up in Ronan working with a bunch of docs up in Ronan. Um, so that's sort of an overview and we, we really feel like in many ways people who are drawn to work in rural and underserved settings often also have a very strong interest in working overseas in international settings because often those are very resource poor settings as well and so um, we find that there's often an overlap and I think this particular group of physicians is uh, somewhat of a nice example of that, of people who've had some experiences and interests in that and may have been part of what drew them to work and be interested in a career in family medicine uh, in a particular uh, underserved family medicine uh, as a focus. So uh, that's sort of an overall uh, intro to what we're planning to do. So my name is Narissa and uh, I was actually born and raised here in Missoula. I was born um, at St. Pat's Hospital back when they still did deliveries and um, went to high school at Hellgate High School and then uh, left Missoula to go to Portland, Oregon for my undergraduate studies. I went to Lewis and Clark College. Lewis and Clark College has a very strong emphasis on uh, study abroad programs. Um, about 60% of their students end up going on study abroad during the time that they're in their undergrad. And most of those sites are actually in <coughs> developing countries. So unlike the typical sort of study abroad set up in Europe, um, they have a lot of programs set up in um, third world countries. And the, the place where I went to spend five months during my undergraduate training was in Kenya. And it was a field experience. So we were based in Nairobi, um, but only briefly. So we would spend a few days in Nairobi and then go out into various parts of the country for two weeks at a time, do homestays with various uh, families. We did language training in Swahili. We also spent time um, in the Maasai Mara doing wildlife investigation. We helped build a school. We, um, we really had a very varied experience during the time that we were there. And one of the things that we also did was work on an independent project. And one of the projects that I chose to look into was ways to encourage cooperation between traditional and modern healers. And I think for, in many respects, at that point I was already pretty sure that I wanted to go to medical school. And it was a great opportunity for me to have a chance to interview and talk with providers in another country, not only who were practicing within the more familiar Western model that um, I was interested in, had been exposed to, but also with traditional healers and to find out that most people in Kenya routinely see both for their health care. And so to really think about how that is coordinated um, and communicated or not. So, um, so that was my experience in undergraduate, and then I, after that I went to medical school uh, at Harvard, and Harvard actually had a, a unique um, opportunity where uh, medical students could take a fifth year of medical school um, and not have to pay an extra year of tuition. Um, and so during that fifth year, I was able to go overseas again and went to Tanzania this time and worked on a small island 
Um, there's uh, the island of Zanzibar, which is off the coast of Tanzania, and just north of that is an even smaller island called Pemba, which is a very, um, uh, it's, a, it's a Muslim area, very traditional Muslim area, and I worked uh, at a World Health Organization site studying uh, parasites in school children, um, intestinal parasites. So I got to look at all sorts of lovely little tapeworms under microscopes and also got to spend a little bit of time um, in the local <coughs> hospital getting some hands-on clinical experience. Uh, my husband, John, who's also in the audience and is also a faculty member here at the residency, um, he was getting his master's in public health at the same time. And so we managed to take 10 weeks um, while he was getting his master's and I was uh, finishing up that fifth year to go to Guatemala as well. And while we were there, uh, we were stationed at a very small village north of uh, Guatemala City called San Juan Sacatepecas. And we would go out each day. Guatemala has a, basically the way their, part of the way that they fulfill the healthcare need in their country is that when uh, students finish medical school, their intern year is basically spent serving in rural areas, being the doctor for those communities. And so we were paired with some of these um, recent graduates of medical school in Guatemala uh, to go out to various rural outposts. Um, many of them were just a single room that had been converted into a clinic. We might have been on, you know, on pothole roads a couple of hours in the back of a truck to get to them. Uh, and would do some health outreach in those, in those clinic settings. After uh, graduating from medical school, uh, John and I did our residency in Tacoma, Washington. And um, one of the rotations that we did while we were in residency it was up in Browning on the Indian Health Service, um, at the Indian Health Service Hospital there on the reservation. And for us, that was a really eye-opening experience and I think in many ways really convinced us that, um, that up till that point we had really thought we wanted to maybe try and go overseas after finishing um, our residency. Uh, not quite sure how we would manage to do that and also pay off the um, close to $100,000 worth of loans that we had both <laughs> managed to accumulate. Um, but while we were there working for the Indian Health Service, we found that in many ways, working for the Indian Health Service um, satisfied a lot of the reasons why we thought we wanted to go work overseas, which is the ability to work in a very different cultural context um, and in, a, in a, a different healthcare system, really, because the Indian Health Service, for those of you who heard my talk before, is is, is funded and managed very differently from the way healthcare is in the rest of the United States. And so um, that ended up leading to us spending the next eight years after residency in Zuni, New Mexico, which is a small Pueblo community in New Mexico. And uh, it's surrounded by uh, the Navajo Nation. And so we were working with both Zunis and Navajos. And I was the director of the women's health program there. And then uh, Almost three years ago now, we moved back to Missoula to help uh, start up this uh, family medicine residency. So that's sort of been my trajectory. I'm going to pass it on, let you guys give an intro as well, and then um, we'll have some questions and also open it up to other questions that you guys might have. So I'm Sarah Zuger, I'm one of the residents, and um, I'm from western Washington, grew up there in a town called Puyallup, kind of near Tacoma. Um, I went to college in Bellingham, um, up at Western Washington University, and sorry, <laughs> um, I studied biology and anthropology, didn't really know what I wanted to do, kind of contemplated medicine and did some uh, biochemistry research, decided I didn't really want to do that. Um, and then when it came time to graduate, I was kind of debating, debating between medicine and public health, so I decided to do the Peace Corps um, to kind of help differentiate that. So I went over to uh, West Africa and spent two years in Mali. Um, I was in a town of about 3,000 called Joliba. And, um, Basically, you know, integrated into the community, learned how to speak Bambra, 
which is the local language there, um, and did various public health type projects. Um, the, the main ones being um, I helped form a health committee who then did like a health survey of the community, kind of helped determine what the needs were, what their priorities were, and then they decided that they needed, the sanitation was an issue for them. So I helped um, help them kind of put together a sanitation project where we dug these things called soak pits, which help collect standing water and put them underground so that it decreases, you know, uh, mosquito populations and kind of like the disgusting standing water that's sitting around. So I helped do that and then also I, I worked um, doing um, child nutrition, so I would do baby weighings and identify kids that were at risk and um, did education projects with the mothers, um, teaching them about all different sort of health topics, but most importantly in child nutrition and how to incorporate um, local um, ingredients that were high in protein into the porridges that they were giving their kids so that they were getting a well-balanced diet because normally they would just eat you know, rice or whatever. And so getting some protein powder, some um, peanut powder or something in there to help them grow. Um, so those are the main projects I did. I also uh, worked closely with um, a local physician. Um, and there's 3,000 in my village, but there's a very large catchment area that we provided care to. And so that was kind of my first introduction to rural primary care with a resource limited area. Um, and that was basically the deciding moment, like that's what I want to do. So. Um, basically returned to the states with the intention to go into rural family practice and um, went to University of Washington for med school um, where they have a really good strong you know, family practice uh, program um, and did a lot of rotations in rural areas throughout um, Montana and Alaska and um, I also did a rotation down in Zuni as well so um, and here I am. Um, I hope you can hear me. Uh, my name is Harshida Chowdhury. Uh, I'm one of the resident as well. Um, I was born and raised in India, and I grew up in a small village with a population of around 2,000 people. Um, we have not had like great medical services when I was a kid, and um, there was actually no doctor in my small village. So, and people had no idea about preventive health care. Um, people would only go to a doctor if they are sick. So even I myself haven't visited a dentist till I was in like 12th grade. Um, so I did my schooling um, in the small village and then um, we had to go to the nearest small town for, for the high school education. Um, so when I went to the high school and I was in that small town, um, that was the time when I was exposed to the real world. I mean, I didn't know anything about the world, like what, how rest of world um, does. While I was in my small village, I was kind of living in a small bubble. Um, and then during my high school years, we had a big flood in our small village during the monsoon season. Um, and we had like cholera outbreak after the flood was over and a couple of kids were about to die of dehydration. Um, and there was a couple of volunteers who were um, doing a relief work to transport those people to the nearby town to get the medical care. And I was one of them to be involved in the uh, relief work, uh, transporting people to the nearby town to get the medical care. Um, so I guess that was the first incident which planned planted a seed in my mind that I, I would go into the medicine, but I wasn't sure at that point as well. And then I also did a um, couple of other projects where we would go to everybody's home and talk about the immunization and talk about the, how important preventive health care is and um, uh, make them aware of the health care facilities which are available, like the um, nearest town wasn't that far from our village, but I feel like the people wasn't aware of like when to go to the doctor or because they never been to a doctor, so they don't know like what are the signs and wh when to seek medical help. So I was involved in the couple of projects where we go to the people's house and 
educate them about the healthcare needs and stuff like that. And then um, in India, the medical school is right after high school. Um, so you don't need, you don't do a bachelor's in biology. You go to medical school right after you finish high school. Um, so you learn the biology and human anatomy in the high school itself. Um, so after finishing my high school, I was pretty sure that I would like to go to a medical school. So I did five and a half years of medical school because we don't do a bachelor's in biology. The medical school is five and a half years, uh, where you do four and a half years of schooling, and then there is a one year of internship. And as Nerissa was talking about going to the rural sites and spending that one year of internship, taking care of people in need. Um, so I did spend that one year working in different rural areas and uh, working with different doctors over there and the part of challenge I felt was like um, nobody wanted to practice in the rural areas so it's not like there was a shortage of doctors or there wasn't enough medical school to produce enough doctors but nobody would uh, like to go in those rural areas and practice um, so that was the one problem and another was the health awareness in the people because the village I grew up, like 90% 90, 90 of people were uneducated. My father has a seventh grade education. My mom has second or third grade education. But I'm glad that they had me go to the school and go to the medical school and study well. So, um, And then after I finished my medical school, I practiced. Um, so in India, after finishing the medical school, you can actually work as a family physician. So you don't need to do a residency in family medicine. Recently, like a couple of years ago, they have started a family medicine residency program. But when I graduated, we can like practice medicine right after we are, med we, are we finish the medical school. Um, so I did practice three to four years um, in different rural places after finishing my med school. And then I got married. Um, as you all know, like in India, we we have arranged marriages, so our parents decide whom we will get married. Um, and my husband uh, was working at MSU Bozeman. Uh, he uh, came here for his, ma he's from India, but he came here for his master's in public administration. He did his master's from Auburn University, Alabama, and then he found a job in MSU Bozeman. And I got married to him, and that's how I ended up in Montana. And then <laughs> uh, I was volunteering at a uh, community health clinic uh, downtown Bozeman and working with the people without insurance and people who had low income or who people who had like less access to health care. Um, so I wanted to continue working in the rural with the rural people and then I found out about the new residency program starting in Missoula. Um, so I came down here, spent some time with Narisa, some time with Dr. Miller and a couple of other faculty members. I worked here for two to three weeks and then I decided this is the place I would like to go for my residency. Um, and then here am I right now. <laughs> I'm Megan Speck. I grew up in Anchorage for most of my life and then went to college at, in Moscow at U of I. And um, let's see, after I graduated college, I still didn't know if I wanted to be a doctor or what I exactly wanted to do, so I thought I'd get a master's in public health at uh, University of Washington. So I moved to Seattle in 2002 and kind of hit, that's been my base ever since. Um, <clears throat> so I got a master's in public health and epidemiology because in my junior year of college, I read the hot zone and decided that's what I was going to be. Um, and I was a little jaded, I guess, after my degree. I, I really appreciate my master's in public health, but not all epidemiologists get to wear those cool suits and go chasing exotic diseases, it turns out. Not to deter any of you from going ahead with that degree, but um, I finished that and realized I think I'd rather work with people rather than running analyses and, and doing so much research. So I still wasn't sure what that meant for me. Um, I was probably, I was in like my early 20s and so I joined the Peace Corps like most people do when they 
<laughs> don't know exactly what they want to do. Um, and that was an incredible experience. I actually went to West Africa too, um, different country than Sarah. I was in the Gambia, if anybody knows. It's this teeny country on the coast of West Africa. And <clears throat> two years I was there and um, with a master's degree in public health, they thought I'd be great working at the health office there, which was not open frequently and often didn't have the computers running. So it was actually better for me to work in the village with the women, help them build income generating groups and plant gardens and help the high school students learn peer education techniques. And I taught some of the nursing students their basic computer skills, like how to turn on a computer and how to save files, things like that, which is going to be really helpful because technology is just sweeping. Like it's, it's growing so fast there that I think even those basic skills are going to help. Um, so I, I lived in a village of about 600 people maybe in the Gambia. <clears throat> I wasn't too far from one of the regional hospitals and I spent a lot of my spare time at the hospital um, hanging out with the nurses. Didn't have really any clinical experience, meaning any experience caring for patients at all in my life. I just had my master's degree in epidemiology. Um, so I just kind of did a lot of watching and learning and I did some basic immunization checks for babies and weighing babies and making sure that their nutrition was okay. It's the same thing that Sarah did. And decided that that was really where my heart was, was to be working with people and I think I was sitting one evening in the female ward at this hospital and it was you know, full of patients and, and female patients were twinning up on twin beds so there were two patients to a bed and some of them were on the floor and there was one nurse and no other provider in this ward running around helping everybody and I said well I feel like maybe I could get into medical school and I certainly feel like I'm blessed enough to have the opportunity so maybe I should do that and then come back and see if I can contribute anything like, you know, training new staff or some sort of capacity building in that regional setting. So that's when I decided I was going to start studying for the MCAT, which is the entrance exam for med school, and apply to med school after I got back from the Peace Corps. Um, so it was sort of a circuitous route to, to send me to medical school. And then it took a couple years after I got back to find somebody willing to accept me. But in that time, um, I worked for an NGO in, based in Seattle that does a lot of relief and development work internationally. And I coordinated a program in Haiti that focused on people living with HIV or AIDS and providing sort of pet palliative care in the form of support groups, socioeconomic support, um, providing them with medications, doing some prevention education in the youth in Haiti. Um, so still not really caring directly for patients, doing a lot of public health type work, um, some administrative work, some project management sort of work. But all of that, by the time University of Washington was smart enough to take me as a med student, <laughs> I had gotten experience kind of on the other side of public health and global health, you know, like living in the community, understanding the non-medical needs that affected their health, which I'm sure most of you are, have a great grasp of at this point. Um, and then working on the other side of things as a project manager, understanding how you have to do the funding and the reporting and all the really fun things about public health. Um, so that I was finally ready to maybe actually try taking care of patients. When I got into medical school, I for some reason, and I don't know why, I don't have a great answer for this, but I just didn't even consider anything except family medicine because when you, and if you've been to these places or if they, when you hear them talk about the places, the rural places that they've been, either here or abroad, there's a shortage of providers, period. So it makes sense that if you're going to be out there, you better know as broad a spectrum of medicine as you possibly can. And I liked that idea. I liked being able to know that wherever I was, I at least had some understanding of what was going on with this patient, whether it was affecting their skin or their kid was having diarrhea, you know, the whole spectrum. I had some sense of that. So that's kind of what got me into um, 
family medicine, I guess. And then I applied for this residency out here because I've never lived in Montana before, actually. Um, I do have family out here, so I'm a little biased. But I also like the idea of starting a program from scratch, being part of a new residency, and being able to see where we can go. I mean, the opportunities here are limitless because there aren't places that are already infiltrated with graduates from other residencies in Montana just because there aren't that many yet. Um, so I think that's all I had. I'm kind of curious though because I know a lot of you guys are undergrads. Like, is anybody willing to admit that they're considering medical school? <laughs> cool. Okay, so there's quite a few, quite a few pre meds out there. <coughs> is anybody interested in the Peace Corps? Nice. <laughs> Some overlap, not surprising. Okay. okay. Just curious. So, <clears throat> I'd be curious, and please feel free to raise your hand at any point if any of you have other questions that you'd like to ask. But um, <coughs> for those who um, are interested in maybe going into a healthcare field or um, or or maybe medicine. What do you think, what would you, what kind of experiences as an undergrad do you think might be useful in terms of exploring that or getting some experience or exposure? Are there particular experiences that you think might be valuable? Mm -hmm. Volunteer experience, I think. Mm -hmm. um, that was probably one of the you're talking about for medical school, correct? Mm -hmm. yeah. But yeah. I think, yeah. Any kind of volunteer experience. Mm -hmm. And I think that so much of, a lot of people that I served in the Peace Corps with had volunteer experience domestically working um, homeless shelters or mm -hmm. children's shelters because there is some overlap just in the terms of having very limited resources and seeing people with extreme needs that it's hard to even fathom until you see people that have them and realize that there's that they, they do exist. Um, so if you can get any kind of volunteer, and if you're interested in a clinical field, like going into medicine, then anything in the clinical realm, like shadowing at a doctor's office or volunteering at a clinic mm -hmm. or a hospital. Yeah, and if, if someone is interested in, in international experience, like working in the international places, I do know one organization which is based in USA called Seva International, and they set up, um, and I do have uh, some information I can pass along. Um, they do have summer internship programs. Um, it's eight or 10 weeks internship, and they already have uh, sites uh, in India and some other countries as well. Uh, they would have host families who would host the student for their entire stay and provide food and they are responsible for them during their stay. Um, as far as cost goes, they have you pay for your airfare tickets, and then you pay $400 administration fee, which includes your stay and your food and everything else. So it's your airfare plus $400. Uh -huh. Seva International, and I can pass on the... They came to the Bozeman, Montana, and the one of the person from the program to talk with the students, so that's I, how I know them. So I can pass on the information if you want. And uh, you can fill out the form online. It's free of cost. So. I, Nancy, are you, would you be willing to maybe just share your experiences a little? Because I think Nancy is a wonderful resource uh, to have here in the community as well. Hi, I'm, it's very fun to hear you all present. Um, I'm from the other end of the job spectrum. I'm a retiring family doctor. Um, and the reason I went to medical school was I applied to the Peace Corps and got rejected. So I, <laughs> <laughs> um, I worked here at Curry Health Center for 15 years. I was a director over there and left the university in 2001 because I always wanted to go work internationally. I spent the next 10 years um, three years in Armenia, four years in Rwanda, and three years in Mozambique, um, administering health problem programs, not practicing medicine. And now that I'm back here, it's really fun to see all that's happened here, to see all these family doctors and talking about their cash work, so that's what I'm doing. <laughs> so, um, I, you know, I think to get international experience, it's always somewhat of a vicious cycle. They, they want people who've had some international experience because a lot of people 
that kind of, I mean, it can be very challenging to live in a place that they might not talk your language, they might not react the way you do, they might, you know, I mean, we take many things for granted when we grow up in our home culture and you go somewhere else and you realize that, whoa, I took all these things for granted and they don't see the world the way we do. So um, some people like it and some people it freaks them out and they come home. So I think getting your first international experience can be hard. Um, and volunteering is probably the way to do it. I don't, I don't know if you want to share some of the challenges of, of working in um, very different settings. I'm sure it was not all roses. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's the other way. <laughs> um, like growing up in India and when I came to United States for the first time, like everything was different for me. The healthcare system was different, culture was different. Um, and I, like, even though I did my medical school in English, I am not very fluent at, as, as you guys are. <laughs> so <laughs> that was another big challenge uh, for me. So yeah, definitely it's a challenge to go to another country. Um, you get adjusted after a while, but if you are going there for eight to 10 weeks, it's not enough time, so. <clears throat> yeah, it was a huge culture shock for me. I mean, my, only international experience prior to the Peace Corps was studying abroad in Australia, so <laughs> it was like pretty much the same as here. And then I show up in West Africa, and I was my mind was blown. Um, I found it very challenging at first, very isolating. I mean, I was by myself, and I mean, not by myself, but the only English speaker for miles around, and it was very that was very isolating and learning, having to learn this language, and um, you know, I you know, showed up as a, like, energetic and, like, kind of goal-oriented, you know, Westerner with all these, like, big ideas and wanting to, like, get all these projects started right away. And really, like, the pace of life there is just not conducive to that. So I had to learn how to, like, slow down and just accept that things will happen as they happen or they won't. <laughs> and, um, you know, learning to find people in the community who are, like, motivated. I think that was key because you can't really do anything on your own. You have to just kind of sit back, you form relationships and then pick out those individuals who are motivated and have a vision and then you just kind of help work with them kind of thing. Um, and just and, and just finding things that the community is excited about. You can't go in and have your own ideas. It has to be it has to come from them. And your job is just really to be capacity building. I think that was a big lesson that I learned when I was there. So definitely challenging, though. <clears throat> I'm curious. I mean, other obviously, we have sort of a medicine and family medicine in particular focus. But I think all of you in your experiences have probably seen people in other um, professions who have worked overseas, and Nancy, I'm sure you have as well. And so it might be of interest to all of you who still, you know, may be deciding on what type of career you would like to go into, what other fields there might be opportunities to work internationally in. So what were some of the other? I would say, you know, as far as the Indian Health Service goes, because again, I think that that's a very viable option where there is a lot of need right here in this own, in our own country. Um, there are a lot of different career options within uh, the Indian Health Service and uh, it's, they, they really, they are a, a kind of a nationalized healthcare system where their goal is to improve the care of the, and the health of the entire community and so they put a lot of investment and resources into having not only physicians and nurses, but also um, pharmacists, dentists, physical therapists, and similar to the community health center where we currently work here in Missoula, the idea is to have all of those services under one roof so that when somebody comes in and needs to be seen and they have a health care need, it's not just isolated to that, but you also are able to provide them with that comprehensive level of care um, to really improve the health of, of that entire patient and their, and their families as well. So I think those are some other 
uh, professional fields in which there are a lot of opportunities. <coughs> Well, like in the, I keep going back to the Peace Corps because that's what I know, but, um, you know, there's lots of different sectors. I happen to be in the health sector, but, you know, there's agriculture and there's like small business. And so, you know, people going into other fields were, you know, helping people figure out how to start up their own small businesses or doing like micro loan kind of things or, you know, helping them figure out how to plant gardens or plant trees or, or whatever. So there's there was a variety. I think water sanitation was another one that we had. Education, obviously, that's another big field, so. Yeah, and the organization I was talking about, they do have internship projects available in healthcare, education, environmental awareness, women's empowerment, rural development, and microfinance. So those are the different projects they do have. Yeah. Uh huh. Yep. So anybody can apply for it, like. They have a free online application, so you can fill out the application and go from there. Yeah. I think your panel has a very interesting hypothesis <coughs> underneath it, which is that there's a connection, and it's been quite clear from the presentation tonight. There is some kind of a connection between international experience and wanting to join a residency program that's focused on rural and underserved communities. Um, so, you know, and I'm particularly intrigued by this uh, hypothesis, but I'm not entirely convinced. Um, and here's why. Because why, if, if your hypothesis is right, why is it that both of these two issues, the issue of um, working in rural and underserved communities, and globally now, because you've all talked about how the shortage of providers is everywhere apparent, and we mentioned that there's a shortage of about 4.5 million providers globally. Um, why do we still have such a shortage there, and why do we have such a shortage in family residence and family medicine? So it seems to me like, um, you're really very unique rather than uh, generic. And what, why is that and what can we do to change that? Well, I would just say that I don't, I don't think that an interest in, in working overseas is unique to family medicine. I think there are, within medicine, there are a lot of other specialties uh, and there are many examples of that here in Missoula. Um, of people who are in orthopedics or in ophthalmology or in other specialties who've chosen to do work overseas. I would say that by and large, there's probably a little bit of a different bent in that in the sense that if somebody uh, is going overseas to provide specialized medical care, it's usually going in, providing a service that wouldn't otherwise be available in that community and then leaving. I think that most of us within the family medicine realm, and particularly those who have worked in development type organizations such as the Peace Corps, see some real limitations to that type of work in the sense that, um, yes, it's wonderful for the two weeks that you're there, but then you leave, and what's really changed in that community? What's different? And I think that um, family medicine as a field has much more of a focus on really improving the health of communities and thinking about things in much more of a public health kind of perspective. And so I think for many of us, I mean, there are certainly many family docs who go and, and do that as well, but I think that uh, there are many more opportunities to think about going overseas in ways, um, and not just overseas, but serving in communities locally in the United States as well, where how do you provide a service or empower a community to really make changes for themselves and improve uh, the, the health of their community um, in a way that's sustainable when you're not there. And so I would say that I think that that's one thing that probably is somewhat 
different in general for people who choose to go into primary care and choose to go into family medicine. Um, would you guys agree? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Is there a kind of like rush or like is there something attractive about having a resource limited situation, seeing how much you can really do with that and how far you can stretch that and that's maybe why you're attracted to working in a rural area or somewhere that doesn't have the care that it needs already? That's a great question. Yeah. I yeah. think so. I think that it's also though um, <clears throat> the fact that not only is it exciting to think about what you can do with so little, but also what you can do with the same amount in that setting just seems to make so much more of a difference than that same resource in a, in a more developed setting or a more resourced setting, if that makes sense. It just seems to go further or make a bigger impact. Um, oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, we're, I mean, this panel is great because, you know, the one of the things I'm getting from all of you is about the importance of volunteering, especially abroad. So I am a Kenyan, and I speak for Kenyans in the diaspora, but there has been a great move in my country lately to, like, reject aid or, like, mm -hmm. things like Peace Corps, World health organization, you know, UN, all those things, because we want to grow as a country and not have help from outside, you know, resources and stuff. And so with this volunteering push, like how would you, and I know a lot of African countries that are also coming up, you know, that are developing our seeing are taking more and more into this. If I was to become a doctor and go back home, no one would take me seriously, just because I, I did not study in Kenya. I'm not, you know, I don't know what Kenyans want. Even if I'm a community health major and like I study these things. So I don't know. I ju I'm just wondering how do you reconcile like the whole aid thing and like education and sustainable volunteer? Nancy, did you want to answer? Um, I, I really appreciate your question and I worked in the Middle East for 10 years. So certainly aid has all sorts of uh, exploitive aspects to it. There's no question about it. And I think that's probably what Kenya is reacting to. If they see donors come over with large checkbooks and people live in big houses and fly around and like consultants and, um, and then they go and they take their money with them in the local community is often left with nothing's permanent. So, um, but um, I, I think just a criticism of the aid industry doesn't necessarily mean that every, every volunteer is also guilty of the excesses of a large industry. Um, on the other hand, I do think when you go to volunteer, you go as much for your own personal gain as you do um, at times to give something. And you take a, you know, a, a high school graduate, an American high school graduate, and you put them in a village, and do they really, what is their added value? I mean, should they arrive there and say, because I'm an American, I know more than you do, and I, you all should listen to me? And that's, I think, the learning experience you had is you sort of have to demonstrate your credibility and, and willingness to, or ability to add value. Um, so it's not a, a black and white picture by any means. I'd say there's there's tons of abuses in the aid industry. And I think Kenya, Kenya has, uh, is an impressive country with all sorts of growing uh, local talent. And there's absolutely no reason that foreigners should get, um, should get good jobs in, in place of Kenyans when Kenyans are, can bring local expertise and um, some of the best of the best talent. And so um, I think it's great that Kenya is, is passing all these laws saying, you know, we, we can't give foreigners jobs unless you demonstrate that a Kenyan cannot do the same work. I think it's great that I can't be for the perspective. I think Nancy makes a great point, which is that I, I think it's really important to recognize and have some level of humility about any potential experience that you do in another culture in the sense that really in many ways it is it is for a large part about developing who you are as a person and that you really have as much to gain out of that or more than anybody that you are quote unquote serving on the other hand I think there's some real value to that I think that it's really important particularly at this stage in life to be confronted with 
other ways of thinking about things and other ways of doing things. And I, I think that it really helps shape. I know for me as a physician, it's, it's been a huge added value in the sense that, you know, I may, certainly at partnership, we do have a fair number of patients who come to us from other cultures or who are refugees. But by and large, the bulk of who we're seeing are, um, you know, <coughs> patients who might not have access to care otherwise, who even though they grew up in the same community that I grew up in here in Missoula, their world, their perspective and their resources is very different from what I experienced growing up. And that ability to be able to relate to people and to, um, you know, to form a connection with them wherever they're coming from is really important regardless. You don't, that doesn't, it's a skill and it's a, it's a awareness that I think translates throughout your life and throughout whatever you're going to do, whether it ends up being here in your own community where you grew up. I'd like to respond as well, <clears throat> because I think that um, the government of Kenya will not um, refuse to accept doctors who were trained abroad, who are Kenyans trained abroad, uh, or those who are trained abroad who are not Kenyans, but are willing to contribute their expertise uh, for the good of Kenya. Um, I, I think that they may not give those people priority. They may try very hard to enlarge the pool of Kenyans who can do those kinds of things, and that's great. But we also know that there's a, a fatal flow of expertise that goes on in, not just in Kenya, but in many countries in Africa. So a lot of people who are trained in Kenya are leaving Kenya and going to work in Chicago. Um, so we need to bring those people back, at least part of the time. Uh, but we also need to recognize, and Kenya will recognize this by, by virtue of necessity, that there are people out there who have really good intentions, they have skills that can contribute to Kenya's needs, and those people will still be welcomed, uh, particularly in the medical fields. Um, and so I don't want you to leave today thinking that Kenya is not going to accept. The one country that really tried to do this um, was Eritrea about 15 years ago. And they had to back away from that policy because of the fact that they found that there was just so much human need that was going unattended as a result of that. So I'm, I, I understand the motivation for it, um, and I think that trying to develop uh, the, Kenya's own ability to, to solve its problems has definitely got to be number one. Uh, but that's a long-term process, and you know we accept doctors here from Kenya, and they flourish and contribute as well. And that's part of what's happening in global health today. Uh, people are moving from country to country, and they're exchanging ideas, and they're exchanging insights, and they're learning from the experience in both, and taking it back from where the places they came. Um, so we should encourage this. This is important. We shouldn't block those and close those doors. I don't know how much time we have, but go ahead. Yeah. Yes, I'd like to hear from the residents uh, now, 10 months into their first year, whether you've come to feel that there's any particular tension or conflict even between the values and expectations you brought to your profession. The reality is now that you may have experienced uh, performance pressures in medical economics of medicine as you have practiced it so far. I think that with all the shadowing and then the clinical work that we do in medical school, we get a sense of the, the things about practicing medicine that nobody really likes, like the documentation or the productivity expectations, which, of which there aren't a whole lot on residents yet, at least interns. Um, so I feel like nothing, for me personally, has been too big of a shock. Um, because we 
had the exposure in our pre-med years and then in our clinical years. Mm -hmm. um, the only struggle for me was the documentation part. Um, because in India we do see a lot of patients, but the documentation isn't a big deal. Um, just because there are not a liability issues, so we don't need to document. So that was one uh, thing that keeps me behind in the clinic is the documentation part. But otherwise, um, I feel like my, I'm up to my expectations in this program. Yeah, yeah I'd kind of echo what Megan said too. I mean, I feel like you know, there's just parts of medicine like documentation that you just have to deal with and you don't really like. But other than that, I mean, I feel like I'm very happy and I feel like my, I don't know, this, this program aligns very well with my ideals and how I want to practice medicine and that's, you know, partly why I sought this program out. I just felt like it was a really good fit for me and, um, you know, family medicine in general. It's just, it's really nice to be in a family medicine program. It's much better than med school. So, <laughs> so I don't know, I'm pretty happy. About it. Yeah. I would just add, I'm not a resident, right? <laughs> I want to add my Jesus too, which is I think that working at Partnership Health Center, which is a community health center, for those of you who are not aware, you know, we, we have a sliding scale fee where anybody can be seen regardless of whether they have insurance or not. And we have pharmacy that's available where there's a medication assistance program for patients who can't. So as far as primary care services, I feel like we have a lot to offer. Where it can be really challenging is when we have patients who we would like to refer to a specialist. And there are a lot of specialists in this community who will not see people who don't have insurance. They won't even see people who have Medicaid or Medicare sometimes. And so it can, that can really be the challenge is that, uh, you know, we can provide this certain level of primary care and yet we still have trouble accessing other parts of care for some of our patients. Well, um, you've certainly given us a lot to think about, um, a lot to inspire us by. Um, one thing I wanted to share with you, uh, especially with uh, Sarah and Megan, is that we have the only program in the country today where you can get a Peace Corps prep specialization in health so that you can go into the application process with the Peace Corps having said that I've completed the academic component of what the Peace Corps recognizes as a preparation to go into the medical dimension, the medical uh, component of the Peace Corps uh, experience. And uh, so far this is just a plus on your application process. It's not a guarantee you'll get in or anything. Uh, but there's a move today in, uh, in the Peace Corps to give this more uh, credibility in the future in terms of applications to join the Peace Corps. So um, I'd just like you to know that because uh, encourage people to come here, uh, study here as undergraduates and take that Peace Corps prep specialization and then go off and do the kinds of wonderful things that all of you have done as well. So, would you please join me in thanking um, Megan and Farshida and uh, Sarah and Larissa for the evening that they've uh, informed us wonderfully about in terms of their experiences and how it relates to global health. Thank you.